afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to see you all. This is, uh, as all of these, they're webcasts, so welcome to you in the audience, but also those that are tuning in uh, from afar. This is the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Center for Humanitarian Health seminar series. And we do this once a month, uh, open to the school um, and also required for those who are taking the, the humanitarian health certificate and concentration. And the idea here is really to bring experts that are on the cutting edge of either new or continuing ideas that are, are really changing. Um, and this is certainly one of them, the humanitarian development nexus. Um, for those of you that, that um, don't know what we do within the school is afterwards, in two weeks' time, we meet with the, the students that are um, concentrating in the humanitarian health, uh, taking the certificate of the concentration, and we discuss this more one-on-one -on -one in a seminar-like area. So it is my pleasure today to introduce Caroline Banson. She's a senior operations officer with the, I have to read it, it's a, with the Gro Global Program on Forced Displacement housed in the Fragility, Conflict and Violence Unit at the World Bank. Um, before joining this unit, she worked in the Middle East, North and South Sub-Saharan African regions and focused on various aspects of, development peace ne of the development peace nexus. In addition to her employment with the World Bank, uh, Caroline has spent a significant part of her career working with the UN and the EU and DFID in fragile settings, including um, DRC, Guinea-Bissau, Kosovo, and Niger. Uh, Caroline holds a master's degree in political science and international relations from the London School of Economics and the University of Copenhagen, and that's where she's from, Copenhagen. Uh, so it, it's a pleasure. Um, I've met Caroline for many years now, actually, when I was when I was at UNHCR, and what the bank is doing together with UNHCR and DFID and others is is quite extraordinary. And we've discussed this a little bit in the past, but she has uh, both the history as well as some firsthand experience, and she's just come back from Burkina Faso looking at trying how how can we implement this because I, I think as we've spoken before ideas are great but how to practically do it when you get two different animals like uh, the World Bank and UNHCR and others working together so um, the plan is for her to speak till approximately 1 p.m. and then take uh, questions from you so Caroline thank you very much are you going to move around if not you can just here. Sorry, then. And then this should, let me just make sure. Yeah. Yeah. All and right. then, yeah. And then this should be a, yeah, if you want this. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Paul's mentioning, I'm, I'm more of a pr practitioner than an academic. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, is walk you through a little bit some of the thinking that we've been doing in the forced displacement arena on how we actually manage to meet the needs of forced, the forcibly displaced as well as the host communities who are often caught in not neatly designed humanitarian buckets or development envelopes or however else that a lot of donors and international organizations are looking at them. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit generally about the refugee and, and forced displacement crisis. Um, I will be trying to look a little bit and, and, and get some of the um, sort of the nitty gritty details of why the traditional model has, has shortcomings, so what it is that we're trying to do. And then try and say, well, if, if it is beyond humanitarian issues, what is the development approach? And finally, in reality, how has this working in the nexus actually looked like? Um, I just want to briefly uh, point your attention to the um, a quote by Trick Villier, one of the uh, early UN Secretary Generals, who actually already back then was talking about um, having development lenses used for, for refugees. Um, so, First of all, if we look at the um, displacement crisis in itself, a lot of this is probably known to you, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but for just it's, I think it's, it's helpful with a little bit of a, a reminder. So we're talking about approximately 65 million people, um, and contrary to what a lot of the jargon has been, is actually not the biggest refugee crisis in history. Actually, we don't know what it looked like even during Second World War, even before. A lot of the data was not available. So, so let's just say, at least since we have start tracking uh, in the early 50s, 
um, it is a big, it is a major refugee crisis. But what we also have on top of that is um, an increasing population of Palestinians due to basic demographics. Right? It's a fairly stable and um, consistent problem. Then there's the issue of the IDPs. So often when we're looking at this explosion, exploding number of, of displaced, it's often based on the number of IDPs that you see um, on the right side. However, the problem with those numbers is that we actually don't know how many they are. These are basically guesstimates. They could be highly overestimated or they could be highly underestimated. We basically don't know. Definitions are very difficult to come by. We're relying on governments that may have um, an interest in either keeping the numbers high or keeping them low, depending on specific uh, political context. Um, it's very difficult to, you know, you have a lot of short-term um, displacement, uh, etc. So just to say that it is actually a very data-poor area that we are entering into, which, which, as I'll get to later, poses a lot of problems in the way that we, that, that we address it. Um, also, contrary to popular myth, at least I'm European myself, but also here in the US, right, you end up believing that it's almost like a European and, and American crisis. But actually, most of the, of the forcibly displaced are, hosts, are hosted in low and middle income countries. Um, you see, on the, on the refugee side, um, it's, it's a lot in the middle income countries. Um, people go where there's safety, where there's... Uh, some, some form of, of, of government protection. And IDPs, of course, are staying in the conflict, um, in the conflict countries that they're coming from. Um, another thing that's also contrary to the myth of all these um, displaced people in camps, a majority are actually living outside of camps, which, of course, in itself um, poses a lot of challenges to the way that we address it, both from the humanitarian and development community. Um, the other, the, the third myth is sort of how long are people actually staying in, in their displacement status. Um, traditionally, it's been seen as a very temporary issue. People would flee, everything would go back to normal, and they would go back. And then there's sort of an, another extreme myth about um, this average length of displa displacement being 17 years. But if you look at it, there's a lot of, a lot of devils in the details, right? If you look at the 30, around the 35-year hump, there's a lot of Afghanis. You have another one around 25 years as the Somalian, right? So depending on how the Syrian crisis is going to end up looking in the long term, you may have other humps that are sort of over time moving, moving towards the right. We also say it's not, it doesn't look the same in each region. Um, as you can see in, in the Middle East and North Africa, you had a huge increase in number of IDPs, not least because of, of course, Syria and Iraq. Um, Whereas in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very different pattern. Um, here you have a, a number of existing conflicts that, that seem to be sort of perpetuating for, for a long period of time. Um, so what does that mean for the way that we, are, the way that we approach it? Um, first of all, if you look at actually the number of countries where most of these displaced people are coming from, it's actually the same 10 conflicts that account for approximately 70% of, uh, of the displaced people, i.e. this idea that there's all these conflicts all over the world and you keep having people that are f sort of moving constantly, it's actually not true. Actually, if we could, we could resolve those 10 conflicts, that would actually have a huge impact on, on the number of, of, of displaced. What it also means is that it's basically the same countries that year in and year out are hosting these displaced people. All right, so the overall idea that, that's sort of embedded in the 1951 convention that any country at any point in time could in theory be a host country or could be a, a refugee producing country is actually, is actually not the case. Which means that the whole re responsibility sharing model that's embedded in the 1951 convention, in reality, it doesn't look that way, right? So you have, have very, very high levels of burden on, on, on just a few, on a few countries. The other thing that's embedded in the, in the sort of traditional refugee, particular refugee hosting model is that um, governments would agree to host refugees, they would give them protection, they would come to a country that was free of conflict, free of violence. On the other hand, the international community would take care of them, they would be held separate from the regular population, often in camps, 
it would be on the full bill hosted by, uh, by the uh, international community. However, what we're seeing over the last couple of years is that a huge increase in the amount of, of money going to humanitarian uh, assistance. And um, what that means is basically that a lot of very long-term situations are being funded with short-term financing, often one-year cycles, um, often done with sort of a care and maintenance uh, philosophy in mind rather than looking at how people can achieve their, their human potential. Um, so, so with this in mind, uh, these two aspects, right, that it's not even responsibility sharing, the fact that humanitarian assistance is expensive um, and may not be always the appropriate way to deal with protracted situations, etc. Um, that's where this whole humanitarian development nexus has come in. That's why also development actors more and more are looking at what is it that actually could be a development response to these particular situations. So at the World Bank, and I'm, I admit that this is very World Bank focused, so you have to, uh, to excuse me for that, and we can talk a little bit more in, in, in questions answer what that means for, for some of the other actors, but for the way that we have approached it in saying, it's not a matter of using World Bank money to finance UNHCR. It's not a matter of development actors going in and basically doing humanitarian work. That wouldn't make sense. In that case, donors, et cetera, could just give the money directly to the humanitarian agencies who are a lot better at doing humanitarian work than development actors are. So instead of, of trying to duplicate what's already been done, we try to figure out what is exactly that, that we can do. Um, the first part is to anchor it in the poverty reduction mandate. What does that mean? That means that for a development actor, status is not really important. Whether you are a refugee or IDP or host community, quote unquote, we don't really care. Um, what we care about is poverty. Are people poor? Are people vulnerable? If you have a rich refugee who has, uh, in a Sy rich Re Syrian refugee in Beirut with kids going to <clears throat> private school, etc., should we care about them? UNHCR might because they may still need protection. Um, they may still need passport documents. But for development um, organization, they don't really, they're not really necessarily that, that important. The other thing is also to say just because the World Bank, for example, decides to engage on this particular topic doesn't mean that we can then get rid of humanitarian agencies or you know, nothing left for them to do. No, there's very different needs, there are very different approaches that are necessary to address this very complex crisis, complex situation. So, it's also um, keeping in mind that it's within a broader effort done by very, very different, very, um, uh, with each organization with comparative advantages, right? So at the end of the day, what is that comparative advantage? And some of it is on financing, analytics, but also access to governments. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more as we move forward, because I think that's a, that's a key thing, uh, trying to find that that next is finding that complementarity with organizations such as UNHCRs and, and, and others that have a long history of working in this area. So what is, at the end of the day, we want to do? We want to look at the medium term, getting away from that short-term horizon uh, of care and maintenance. That's what we can bring. And we can look at the, the socioeconomic dimension versus the protection aspect of, uh, of forced displacement. But also, lastly, also really looking out for the host communities. Host communities are often developing communities that have worked hard to progress along um, towards uh, development. And some of these inflows of, of people can, can endanger that, those trajectories. So that's another key element of a development approach. So, um, so what does that mean in practice? For the displaced, as long as they are like any other poor, we can reach them with our general development programs. We don't need specific displacement programs in order to help them achieve their potential and, and that of their, their communities. However, we also have realized that there are specific vulnerabilities that makes it potentially difficult for them to benefit from some of these other um, efforts. Right? They have lost a lot of assets, a lot of them, been through tremendous trauma. Um, they don't have necessarily the right to work, the right to move freely, the right to get documents, the right to get up bank accounts. That, from a socioeconomic perspective, is problematic and has, can have a huge uh, impact on their ability to, to um, go through a sort of development process like, like any other poor. So for a development organization, we said, well, for us, um, the objective would be to 
help offset some of these specific vulnerabilities so that they become poor like anybody else. Not necessarily to make them better off vis-a-vis -vis host communities, but saying, can they access on equal footing like everybody else? But then for the hosts, there is also work to be done. Um, they don't necessarily, all the hosts look like Jordan and Lebanon, which is such an incredible influx. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Those two countries are really the outliers. But we still have communities that have, um, that are bearing uh, a responsibility to host um, that's not necessarily taken up by government, but taken over uh, by these. So with this changed environment, more people, more um, pressure on, on services, et cetera, what is it that we can do to help them cope with that, uh, with that influx? For a development organization, we can also look at three different aspects of the crisis. Um, what happens before the crisis? Uh, you're having people who are actually having very difficult choices to be made. It's not, and I think that's something that also have to be reminded in both the European and the, and the American context, right? It's not an easy decision. There's a huge number of risks associated with staying, and there's a huge number of risks associated with leaving. Um, the other thing that we notice is that you actually have sort of a, a, um, a hump in, in the uh, displacement figures that are actually quite a bit after um, onset of hostilities, which means that we actually have some predicting to do. We actually have, have a, a potential for, for prepare for these types of situations. And then finally, we also have to remember as for as many people who leave, there's a lot of people that are staying behind, either um, in communities, as IDPs, um, uh, for short period of times, for, for longer periods of times, et cetera. During the crisis, um, no, let me, sorry, let me just get back to before the crisis. So what does that mean for development actors, right? That means, first of all, that we actually can talk about prevention or uh, not necessarily prevention of conflict. That's other people. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that as development actors, but at least from a, a displacement point of view, that's, that's sort of a different, whole different ball game, right? But what we can look at is how can we prevent some of those vulner added vulnerabilities among the displaced? Is there something we can do up front to prevent that? It's also looking at preparedness. Can we work with governments? If you look at a country like Chad, if they don't get refugees from the south, they've got to get them from the north or the east or the west, right? Can we have a conversation up front with governments to prepare their systems for these new inflows of people? But then also, what can we do for those people who stay behind? How can we better engage in insecure environments or in safe pockets of, of insecure countries. Um, that's another challenge and, and something that's, that's very important for development actors to do. So during the crisis, we talked a little bit about that before. What we found is that actually a lot of the impacts are local. You rarely see, and again, Jordan and Lebanon being the outliers, but you rarely see sort of macroeconomic impact at, at the country, at the national level. But you can have quite significant impact at the local level. Um, Often we see them exacerbating existing um, uh, problems, right? You have lacking regions where there's just no jobs in general for anybody, just coming back from northern Burkina Faso in the Arid Sahel region, and there's just nothing, right? Whether it's for host communities or whether it's for refugees, this is a, a, a structural issue. Um, what we, we also see is on some of the, so the local markets, whether it's prices, jobs, housing markets, that you also have very, for poor people, very painful, uh, hikes in prices, for example, um, increased demand for jobs uh, that, that, that put pressure on, on wages and therefore have an impact on their lives. And then, of course, sort of a, sort of a capacity issue for a lot of services if they have um, a lot more clients to, to take care of. Um, so for the displaced people, um, we are also looking at what is it that can make them uh, access some of these development uh, programs, for example. What we find out is jobs educations are absolutely critical. That's what a lot of us, including everybody in this room, that's, that's how we see ourselves, that's how we make a living, that's how we can care for our, our, uh, our loved ones. Um, and then we have a huge, huge, and I'd, I'd be happy to discuss that with you afterwards, one of our huge challenges is dealing specifically with women and girls. Where are the needs different? How do we address them? How do we get them into be, becoming agents um, in, in very, very challenging environments. So for there, a lot of the focus has been on how do we sort of alleviate some of the immediate impact. Um, a lot of that's been done by humanitarians, but can you actually look at government systems um, expanding capacity to take you know, refugees into schools or IDPs into schools, into health clinics, et cetera? Um, 
How can we work on getting more jobs to some of these areas? Can we even can we support um, help people move freely so they don't necessarily all end up in a lacking region where there are no jobs? Um, then, if you look at towards uh, look sort of for the longer longer term, so UNHCR has are working on the concept of durable solutions, which is basically a concept that's looking at the protection mandate. To be very, we can discuss that as well. But sort of traditionally, it means are you protected by government um, for refugees, right? So either you have by your own government, or you're protected by um, the host governments, or you can be naturalized and be protected by your new government, so to speak. Um, there's also the resettlement option, um, et cetera. But for our social, socioeconomic um, organizations, there's slightly different things in play. Can you look at inclusion, long-term inclusion that goes beyond nationality, the right to work, migrant status, economic opportunities, where if you're an Afghan in northern Pakistan, which you're seeing, by all intents and purposes, except for that passport, you are fully integrated in, uh, although right now it's a little bit yeah, I realize the political aspect's a little bit a bit more complicated, right? But you can also look in a situation where you actually do get nationality, which we've seen some of the Burundians in Tanzania, which have obtained Tanzanian citizenship, but still remain um, challenged by certain socioeconomic conditions that does not make them fully included in, in Tanzanian life. Um, the other thing that to us is also very important is, is the whole issue of return. I mean, what we've seen, uh, not least in, in Afghanistan, for example, that we have had return. On the other hand, people also then left again. Right? So it's not just about return. It's also about how do you make return sustainable? Um, and, and that enters into the whole also conversation about host governments, host uh, communities deal with these refugees because the more um, assets that people have when they go back, the bigger likelihood that they actually be able to to make it once they go once they go home to their um, to their country. But we also know that it may not go back home to their own communities, right? Even if they go back to Afghanistan, if they lived for a long period of time in an urban urban uh, community, they may not go back to the countryside of Afghanistan, right? right? So so how do we make sure that they don't just end up being IDPs um, once they go back? So um, one of the big challenges for the World Bank of, of getting engaged in this has been in how we actually finance it. So um, we've had a bit of a breakthrough through two different mechanisms. Um, one is what's called the Global Concessional Financing Facility that actually started out as a MENA uh, financing facility. Um, Jordan was one of those countries that were very good at, um, at making it clear to the international community that they actually did pay a price. Um, so what we managed to do for, for this side was to set up a... I try not to get too much into boring details about how the World Bank works and our financing works, but basically being able to buy down the interest rate for more expensive, still cheap, but more expensive um, credits coming under the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and get them down to what's the type of lending that we do to poor countries, um, which is under the International Development Association, which is very, very cheap financing, basically. Very, very cheap loans. So... Um, that was to help Jordan and Lebanon deal with the inflow. But at the same time, we also managed for the International Development Association countries, the low-income countries, where they actually already get very cheap financing, but why would they use the envelope that they get to spend on non-nationals? Right? So here the question was, how can we expand that envelope to make sure that it could account for these additional people in their country? Um, so... For both of them, the focus is to do what we do best at the World Bank, which is looking at, as I said, the medium-term socioeconomic dimensions. How can we mitigate the shocks, as we were talking about the, before, for host communities and for refugees? How can we facilitate sustainable solutions in a way that's different but complementary to what um, UNHCR does? And how can we actually start those preparedness conversations that I was referring to before with a country like Chad, to see how can we actually also be more cost effective, more efficient um, already when people arrive. Um, in order to access these funds for both, both of these two different types of, of instruments, um, have to have either more than 25,000 refugees or 0.1% of the population. What was also clear is that there, of course, are certain reputational risks. What if we start giving lending money to a country that then end up um, 
arresting people, doing refoulement, etc. So we work very closely with UNHCR to get their advice on what is an adequate protection framework. How can we ensure that those countries that get this additional cheap financing are actually working to help refugees? Um, so that's been, that's been very important. I can get back to that a little bit later on how we work closely with UNHCR on some of these issues. Um, but we also ask the government to provide strategies. Getting outside that mold of it being refugees being sort of outside the government, control outside the government, sort of even worrying about them, trying to see if we can pull them back into national development plans, national development strategies, trying to push them to see what kind of policies and policy changes could be made in order to make life easier for, for hosts and refugees. Um, we've had uh, a number of countries that have been de declared eligible for IDA 18, in addition to the two uh, GCFF, sorry, the dots got a little bit off here, but basically the, the, the green ones are the two, uh, the middle income, uh, Jordan and Lebanon. Um, the red ones are the ones who's already been taken to the board and declared eligible, i.e. having had those both the government strategy, having the UNHCR saying there's an adequate protection framework and basically living up to the eligibility criteria. Um, and then we have a number of countries where we're working on, on getting it uh, to that process. So basically what it means is that we got $2 billion for um, three years to, to help host communities uh, under IDA 18. These, this money will be uh, distributed based roughly along the lines of how many refugees they're hosting. Right? It is not meant as, as a compensation, but it's meant to help them deal with, with, with that inflow. But we are also taking into consideration how ambitious are they in their uh, policy commitments, um, what are their capacity to actually implement projects. So also looking at some of our existing portfolios and the way that we work in, in the World Bank. Um, it is not an ap apolitical exercise. Um, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely certain. So some countries have been very keen on uh, accessing, also countries that we did not necessarily expect beforehand. Uh, we're very happy that Pakistan, for example, is the one that has engaged quite constructively with us. Um, Ethiopia is another one that also came with their very uh, progressive uh, promises made at the Obama summit or the summit in, in 2016 in relation to UNGA, for those of you who've been following that. Um, but you also have countries like uh, Bangladesh, probably not a surprise, um, who are a little bit less comfortable with it because it talks about a medium medium term horizon. Um, and, for, and for Bangladesh, it's been very important to keep it as a more short term issue. Um, the, you have other countries where they're just not comfortable and don't think they should take any loans, even if it's on very, very good terms, that do not want to actually, they think that this international community should give grants uh, for this particular issue. Um, so what we've done in order to, to prepare is that We've done, uh, rather than just go in with sort of a, a cookie cutter approach to how we should respond to these situations, we basically um, did a number of uh, joint uh, missions with UNHCR to take a look at what were the possibilities for finding these longer term solutions. What are the possibilities of more progressive policies? What are the possibilities of using existing World Bank um, expertise, access, uh, connections to do something that was really complementary what was already being done by, by UNHCR. Um, those missions have all been very fascinating. As, as Paul was mentioning, I just came back from Burkina Faso, where we also uh, did the same thing, uh, went out and talked to both refugees, host communities, to figure out what, what were their challenges, what are the needs, um, and, and how to move forward. Having very interesting conversation with governments on how, how to improve uh, freedom of movement, um, access to, to jobs, et cetera. Um, so, which is a good segue into sort of the next, uh, the next part of the, of the presentation, how that actually looked like in, in reality. So what we found is that, more specific, what is it that we have to offer? And I think that's been very useful having that, that conversation very clearly up front with, with an organization like UNHCR. <clears throat> So rather than having one year funding that's depending on sort of uh, the calls, the, what are the call for contributions, I think they're called, right? No, the, uh, the global appeals, the global appeal process, which is highly unpredictable. It all depends on which other uh, crises are happening in other countries at the same time. Um, but also, I can imagine, not coming from the development side, how difficult it must be to do one year 
programming and budgeting. Um, that, that just calls for, for short-term solutions, right? The other thing is that we can also tap into different kinds of sources. Um, we do bonds, we do guarantees. I mean, we are, at the end of the day, we're also a bank, right? So that, that allows us to actually get, use the market, use the market mechanisms to raise funds in a way that, that other organizations uh, cannot do. And then we can actually use different instruments. Um, we do, in many other sectors, we do budget support, which are tied to certain policy or reform uh, initiatives in, in specific countries, right? So in theory, we could tie, saying you help on, on these more progressive policies. In theory, we can, we can help you support that through budget support or what we call program for results types of instruments where instead of just giving money up front for certain activities, you say if you get X number of girls to stay five years in school, let's say, just making it up, right? we then disperse money according to that because we know there are expenses associated with, with achieving those results. Um, the other thing where we also think that we have a, a, unique, a, a unique role to play is the fact that we don't just show up once the crisis is there. For many of those countries, the host countries, we've had decade-long interactions, uh, policy dialogues, and also actually covering a lot of the sectors where forced displacement is relevant, including education, including health, including labor market policies and whatnot. So rather than having a sort of a separate issues that you dealt with one little side of government, trying to pull it into all the relevant sectors, all the relevant actors in a country to discuss how we can uh, improve inclusion, how we can improve, improve uh, responses to these situations. It also means that we actually have a lot of very specific sector knowledge on education. Right. So how do you get indigenous people to go to school, let's say? Can we learn from that and use that for refugees? Right. How do we actually engage in lacking region, regions? That's a general development problem. Can we use a lot of that knowledge to use that specifically also for refugee situations? And then, as I mentioned before, actually having a preparedness conversation that the humanitarian sort of reactionary response doesn't allow for because we are there and we, ha we know these actors, so we can have those types of conversations up front. Then finally, we also have a very different horizon than humanitarian actors. Um, humanitarian actors need to save lives, they need to do it now, right? You have an inflow of, of people and, and you need to be able to provide shelter, food, et cetera. This is a very important life-saving mechanisms. You can't go and dilly-dally with, with money on that. You don't have the time necessarily to do long, longitudinal studies and figure out how, some of these things work. We, we, we can do that. Um, we have both the analytical capacity as well as, as the time and money to, to look into that. Um, we pride ourselves as being knowledge-driven, evidence-driven. Uh, so rather than just react, trying to look at these, some of these issues um, from a more uh, structural, systematic way to see to what extent we can actually know better what works. Can we say something about if, if, if you give refugees the right to work? How does that impact your own labor market? How does it impact your own economy? Rather than just assuming or hoping or being aspirational that the refugees have the right to it, right? So complementing that conversation with, with some of that. Um, the other thing that's is still sort of new um, is looking also at some of the long-term impact of short-term decision-making, right? Um, if you have a new refugee camp being in the spirit of, of acting and acting fast, I mean, looking at a place like, like Uganda with the inflow of, of South Sudanese, you don't have time as a humanitarian to, to, to wait around too long. But if you put a, um, just using this example, a refugee camp right next to a pristine forest, and people don't have any way to cook their food, you know that forest is going to be depleted in, in a very short period of time. So there are long-term impacts of short-term decisions. So that's also something that we, we think that we can add to that conversation and help humanitarians, actors, also think through some of these decisions that are, that are made. So um, the, the relationship with UNHCR has expanded uh, quite rapidly and quite constructively. Um, uh, seeing it evolve over the last couple of years have been, have been quite exciting. Um, from my point of view, I think a lot of it came from a little bit of a change in mindset or maybe realization. Often uh, when the World Bank deals with UN agencies, um, I was about to say just between us, but since it's being webcast, maybe that's, a, that's not a good idea. But th there is a tendency to 
Also because a lot of actors don't understand the World Bank, that the CS is another donor. So you and agencies expecting the World Bank to go in and help finance certain activities, for example, in the humanitarian sphere. And I think what was really been clear is that sort of a fundamental uh, appreciation or understanding of UNHCR and saying the World Bank can come in and actually do something different. It's not a matter of getting the World Bank to finance UNHCR activities. Um, recognizing that we have distinct mandates, not trying to convince the other one to do what we do. Right? Respecting that, in that nice, if you have the two concentric circles for a nexus, right, that there are certain things that will be clearly UNHCR, there will be certain things that's clearly World Bank, but then you have that nice little thing in the middle where we actually have some of the same objectives and where we can work, to, work together. Um, so the World Bank has engaged more and more also beyond just the, the, the programming, the projects, really trying to engage in that global dialogue at the moment um, which is in the preparation of the Global Compact, for example, um, but also on the uh, Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, uh, which has a secretariat with, with UNHCR, looking at how at the country level do we engage all the various partners with all their various comparative advantages, but not, not least putting government in, in the driver's seat, um, getting them involved in that. Um, we have done a number of sort of joint not road shows, but a lot of events where we have um, worked together, making sure that it was one from, from each side, uh, talking about these various issues. And then another thing that is, that is quite exciting is on the, on the whole data collaboration. This is less, less sexy, probably, but um, I think if you're all health, health um, experts, you know the, the value of, of, of research, you know the value of data and, and how that impacts the way our efficiencies and, and, and the way that we work. Um, UNHCR has a lot of the primary data. They do um, incredible amounts of, of collection of, of uh, microdata on refugees, um, but don't necessarily have the time and the money to, to make full advantage of that. The World Bank, on the other hand, does regular household surveys, um, a lot of in-depth um, studies on poverty and development. And putting those two things together actually opens up a whole new world of, of understanding um, and of, of a potential for improving the way that we operate, the way that we reach these populations. Um, so at the operation level, that also means that we have started quite in-depth collaboration on trying to figure out what works. Um, as I, I was mentioning before, um, cash versus in-kind, um, NGO, let's see, parallel systems of education delivery or health um, services to incorporating in, in national systems, for example. What are the pros, what are the cons? Um, trying to really get us a better sense of where does it make, where, where does these various levers that we have, where do they function, where, they, where don't they, where do we need to keep it, no, that is humanitarian, continue doing what you're doing, and where can we change? Um, and then we had some, some also very good collaboration at the country level in preparation of the Ida 18 min window, as I just mentioned. Um, really trying to have everything from policy conversations to data conversations um, to interventions, taking advantage of the expertise that each, each, of, the, each of the actors bring uh, to the conversation. So for a little bit, so trying to bring it up to a more wider humanitarian development nexus conversation, which for some of you might be more interesting than just UNHCR and the, and the World Bank. So what has actually made this collaboration work? What is it that all of a sudden, after having tried for decades, I mean, this is a conversation that's been popping up again and again um, with various initiatives, various MOUs, um, but never really managed to sort of uh, gel um, so some of the critical elements that we have identified is, is, first of all, I mean, let's not underestimate the impact of having a bunch of Syrians showing up on, on European shores. I mean, what that did to our shareholders, what that did in terms of what we could talk about, how being able to bring development actors into this conversation. I mean, let's not, I mean, even if it's not a, a great reason, it's, it's been very impactful uh, in that sense. So there's a whole different level of political focus that does not seem to be go away right now. We're trying to make, make the best use of it, using that to our advantage. So we can institutionalize approaches, collaborations, so when the focus goes somewhere else um, for another health crisis or uh, whatever else is gonna show up, that we have something that's actually sustainable. 
Um, what we've also seen is uh, this convergence of, of agendas between uh, humanitarian and development, particularly on, the, on this issue. Um, a lot of, as we talked about earlier, right, how much of humanitarian assistance is actually going into long-term situations. So you're actually having humanitarian agencies saying, we are drawn into all these development problems, um, which are quite technical, which are, are very um, complex dynamics. And we don't, we don't know enough, and we don't have enough money. At the same time, we also have actors like the World Bank being pulled more into what's seen as humanitarian field, whether it's on famines, on Ebola response, et cetera. There's a, there's a stronger push in the international arena for the World Bank and, and other development actors to be able to provide some of our services on, on these types of issues. So those two things have really been pushed on from both sides to have that, to have that nexus. Um, we're also seeing sort of new, new actors getting involved. There's a lot of discussion on the private sector, how to use private sector, both financing but also approaches. What's their role in creating jobs um, in some of these very difficult situations, um, which has also pushed us in, in thinking along new, new lines. You've got um, the use of technology. There's sort of a lot of things, sort of the whole disruptive whatever economy and technologies that are entering into the space that's, that's thought-provoking and, and in a positive way have, have pushed us forward uh, on this issue. The other thing from our point of view, and I mentioned that earlier, without money, the, there's a limit to what the World Bank can do. And, and, we, and we managed to solve that issue um, through the GCFF and the IDA 18. So that also, also for those of you who are not familiar with the World Bank, that is, that is how the organization is driven, right? If we can't do, at the bottom line, we do a lot of knowledge, we do a lot of small stuff, but at the end of the day, if we don't have a lending portfolio behind it, it will stay at the fringes. So now we have that, which means that our health colleagues, our education colleagues, our transport colleagues, all of a sudden are starting to engage in this conversation and bringing their sexual expertise into it. Um, finally, also this thing of, of, of the joint goals. I think I mentioned a little bit with the World Bank UNHCR conversations, is trying to really figure out what it is that's joint and what's not. Um, as I said, I think that has also helped us move quite rapidly because we have been able to distinguish a little bit between, between those two groups of, of non-joint and, and joint. Um, there's still a number of challenges um, in the way that we, we deal with this. Um, they're still on the, on the goals. There has been some clarification, but that doesn't mean that it's 100%, right? So we are very much in the experimental phase. Again, the, the, the proof is going to be in the pudding, how we actually implement a lot of these projects. How are we going to uh, basically move the policy dialogues? Is that still in a way that's, that's consistent with humanitarian and protection mandates? Um, we know we have a lot of concern from uh, both NGOs and UNHCR on, on what this does to protection. If you sort of assume that it's undertaken by government, is there actually anybody left to look out for the interest uh, and the rights of, 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 um, of refugees, for example? There's also unclarity about expectations. There are some, some partners who believe that because the World Bank is now engaging in this area, all of a sudden we'll be able to cover everything and there's not, no longer be need for, for any sorts of other actors to, to be engaged. So um, I think that's also something that's a potential pitfall as we move forward, that, that we simply cannot move up, live up to expectations that, that are created through these um, various instruments. There's also still a little bit of an issue of language. Um, I uh, did a training for UNHCR, what we call World Bank 101. And I think the fundamental business model of the World Bank, of, of lending, being a bank, um, is still difficult for a lot of, of actors to understand. And sort of not just understand, but also then seeing the opportunities of using that model to the benefit of refugees and, and host communities. Um, so it's everything from, from, from understanding the business model, but also something to as simple as what UNHCR calls livelihoods, we call jobs or income, right? So you have, you have sort of a whole string of a very different terminology and different ways of, of looking at it that I think is, it will still take a number of years before we sort of fully get, uh, get, get over that. Um, the other thing I, I think that's, um, that has been sort of interesting moving forward is that partly because two such heavy actors as UNHCR and the World Bank has started to collaborate, 
it's created a certain impetus within the system. Um, there's a lot of other organizations that want to engage also in this conversation, and uh, we've been opening it up. But we're also sort of being aware that the more you open up, the more different kind of interests come into play, which have advantages of including those. But it can also make things a lot more complicated and, and lead to a certain level of, of inaction. So that's one of the things that we're struggling with at the moment of, of how to do that um, in a constructive and as inclusive as, as possible. The final one, I think, is absolutely critical. I think it's going to be very interesting to see as we move forward. And I'd love to continue this conversation also in the question and answer section, because how do we how do we approach governments? I mean, I've had a lot of conversation with humanitarian actors um, and, and actors, not least on the, on the refugee field, with a very fundamental distrust of governments. Whether they have the capacity, whether they have the right intentions, whether they are truly looking out for refugees or host communities. Um, and that is something I think that also then permeates a little bit the way that we operate. Because at the end of the day, the World Bank is going to continue to do what we do best, which is to work with governments. With, in spite of all their flaws, in spite of all the problems that we're facing, that's still the way that we operate. They're our main counterparts. Um, so, so how, let's say, in a situation where... Um, I, so let me use Burkina Faso as an example. Right? So up in the Sahel region, there's very little state presence. Um, you have underserved, underserved population through decades. There's very little... Uh, provision of services, very few economic opportunities, etc. Right? You have a Malian population that's basically coming from nothing. Very much the same context. Moving into this area with, with basically nothing. They come in, they're being put in a camp and being provided with services, economic opportunities, in-kind assistance, cash assistance, etc. That in a, in a level that they never experienced before and that the host community is not experiencing. Right? So the fundamental question do we bring everybody down to the same level? Or do UNHCR and others, through the 1951 convention, have obligations that has an international standard rather than a Malian and a Burkina Faso standard? Right? I think that's a very fundamental question that I think has the potential of creating a lot of friction and a lot of debate also among other organizations that have the rights of the refugees as their primary mandate. Right. So how, how do we deal with that? How do we deal when governments both can't provide those services? And when do we have a situation where, you know, there are maybe not complete refoulement, but there's other types of, of pressure for refugees to move back? How do we deal with those situations? Um, so that was sort of some of the various aspects um, that I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of... Uh, if, Great insight. I know some of you already just been to Myanmar with a very specific IDP situation that, that brings up a lot of the same challenges of, of how we approach these topics. Um, but I'd be happy to yeah, have an engaging conversation with you on some of these very difficult uh, dynamics. Thank you. Please stay here. Um, thank you very much, Caroline. Just one point of clarification that at Johns Hopkins, data is very, very sexy. Um, <laughs> um, you've really been able to elucidate some of the issues that we've tried but maybe have not succeeded um, in discussing, which is having two extremely different organizations come together and the, the, the complexities. Um, and not just as the World Bank changed dramatically in the last while, but being at UNHCR and seeing the way it, the, the agency has changed, it wouldn't have been possible, at least from, from UNHCR's point of view, a decade ago. So it's, we're at a, a time, I think, now that hasn't occurred, and, and I do agree that it's, it's the, the Syrian s situation, the crisis, has been an impetus for, for a lot of this. Um, so I'd like to open it up for questions, comments. Because we are doing webcast, we need two. Maybe, Court, can you help us for one sec? There's one there, but maybe we'll, uh, and I can't see over, oh yeah, there are two. So if either you can stand up and or ask uh, for the microphone, I think you have to, um, at the bottom, Court. So taking some, some questions uh, and or comments. Yes, Mohammed. 
we'll take maybe a couple. You may have to open. You may have to open it, uh, Mom, and uh, turn it on at the back. And maybe we'll take a couple questions. Oh, this and one's on. Have... <laughs> yeah, of course. And apologies about the table up front, because I know some of you couldn't see uh, the bottom of the slides. Um, that was a mistake in the organization. And just please introduce yourselves as well, because of the, uh, the recording. And who you are. Um, uh, uh, oh, first, thanks uh, for coming. Uh, I'm Mohammed, MPH student. So my question is about uh, what are what is the mechan mechanism to coordinate with the government to get guarantees that they want to uh, in the host communities that they want to use the uh, the money and the benefit of the uh, refugees. And uh, how do you evaluate the commitment? Of of the governments uh, to the conventions with the World Bank. Uh, thank you. Another question before we uh, get moving? Lindsay? Uh, hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm also an MPH student. Uh, you mentioned using the same language among all the actors that are involved with the World Bank, whether it be local governments or other NGOs. Um, how is the World Bank working towards using the same indicators so that the data that is collected kind of aligns and matches up for having somewhat similar results? Yeah. Both fantastic questions, actually. Uh, Mohammed, you're diving straight into some of the, the, the complexities of, of, of what, we're, what we're trying to deal with. Um, first of all, let me reiterate the point that this is really, this is new to us. This is really an expanding world and expanding engagement that we, that we haven't seen before. Um, so in order to guarantee that refugees actually get access to this, this is very clear in the, um, the whole rationale for getting those additional financing. Right, that is supposed to benefit host communities and refugees. For them to even do it, we also there needs to be something for host communities. And as we said, we also believe that there's a very good rationale for doing that. So um, different projects seem. So what we're seeing is that we are having a number of, of different projects. Some of them are sort of sector specific. Some of them are trying to deal with like lagging regions where you're trying to have a multi-sectoral approach. Right. So some of them are. Um, a little bit easier in the sense that if they're dealing with a geographical area, right, if you're trying to expand service delivery, um, trying to do skills training, whatever it is that you're doing in a specific area, you make it open to refugees and host communities, and then think through your targeting to make sure that, that each population has, has access, right? Um, the, the other thing could be actually having it in the project document. All right, again, the way that you, that you target. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much in those conversations that that dialogue we always have around either sectors or in specific uh, situations where you prepare a project. Right? So, so all, in order to get this particular money, they, they, have, to be, they have to be able to prove that they, that they do that. But of course, monitoring and eva evaluation will become absolutely critical. And the, your second question is even more tricky for us because the World Bank is very, we're, we're an organization of economists, whereas the UNHCR is, very broadly speaking, right, is an, is an organization of lawyers. We're very uncomfortable with being associated with trying to monitor conventions and some of these legal, legal frameworks, right? So this is why also partly why this collaboration with UNHCR is so important, because they help us think through these things, right, in a way that, that, we, that we're not necessarily e equipped to do. Um, so I can't, this is something that you, is evolving, so I don't have a very specific answer. What I can tell you is that for us, in order to prove that this part of money is actually valuable, valuable so we get it in the next cycle, which is in three years' time, we need to show that we're doing something on the policy environment. We can't, because we're so slow, right, we don't have that immediate impact on our beneficiaries, we won't be able to see that in a year's time when they start discussing whether they want a new cycle. But we will monitor what's happening on the policy front. Right? How, how is it changing? We will be having a continuous conversation with, with UNHCR and the, and, the, and the government in case some of this, the, um, 
what they need to live up to in convention starts moving backwards. So it's, it, it's going to be interesting to see when we get one of these situations, to what extent we're capable of, of addressing it, how we're capable of dealing with in a situation where do we cut lending, do we stop operations, or do we try to engage constructively? You know, and there are pros and cons on, on, on both sides. So that's something to be monitored, and I think something is going to, hopefully you won't see too many examples of it. That, would be, that wouldn't be good, but, but it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it comes. Um, so that also actually links very nicely to the other question on, on common indicators. Um, I think some of the, we've had some conversation, for example, with the IDMC that's doing uh, IDP statistics, um, to what extent we can have use some of this, the, the same indicators. I think that, that the issue for us, and that's where it's been so nice about seeing the topic being spread out a little bit more broadly among our sector experts, is that we don't want to look at it from the necessarily displacement perspective, right? This, is com this comes in through our health programs through our education pro programs, right, where we have actually developed a, a, a number of indicators as well as a long range of methodologies to monitor um, and address them, right? Because as I said, at the end of the day, what we want to look at is how can we help the, the, the displaced to get to a level of regular poor, so to speak, right? Um, where we need to be able to link them back to our other common uh, indicators that's, that's related to to, to poor and vulnerable populations. So this is, um, this is also an, an, an ongoing um, conversation. So at the end of the day, we don't want to be held accountable to humanitarian indicators necessarily, right? Because as we mentioned, that's not, that's not really where we add value um, at the end of the day. Um, so, uh, so stay tuned. Um, we're just at the early stages. Um, I, I, I think I forgot to mention that the, the funds under IDA 18 just became available in July 1st. And that means actually starting preparation of projects, right? And, and, and the World Bank is not just, it's not slow, it's super slow, right? So, I mean, we take years to prepare projects and, and, and get all these, these systems in place, right? So, um, so hopefully you're still engaged and interested um, in a couple of years when we start getting, getting more feedback into the effectiveness, into the impact that we're getting with these types of, of, of projects and interventions. Myself, so this one. Uh, Anyone questions? Hello, I'm Taya, and I'm also an MPH student. Um, you mentioned before that um, some governments had done some surprising policy um, for the refugees, and I wanted to hear some more about that. Should we get one more? Any other? One more question? Yep, Marwa at the back. You may want to go just up there. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Marwa, PhD student. Um, you mentioned that the collaboration is mainly between two partners, which is UNHCR and World Bank, and I understand that having multiple partners involved uh, would create a lot of issues later, but um, in case the agreement is between the host community and uh, World Bank and UNCC, or how to make sure that the um, viewpoint of the refugees themselves are adequately represented in the proposed plan? Thank you. Uh, so on the, on the progressive policies, um, one, I think, key example is Ethiopia that declared that they would, over 10 years, um, basically get people out of camps. Um, I think we're all in agreement that, that camps are to be avoided, that they are not helpful for neither the refugees nor for the local economy or anything of that sort, probably not even for security, although that's often a, a reason that governments uh, use in order to keep, keep people in camps. Um, so, so, so I think that, that one is sort of a, 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 a very nice one, right? But we're having on a number of sort of sexual issues as, as well. Um, looking towards integration inclusion in in the national systems right so we're having what would it take for you as a government to open up um, jobs for for refugees what do you think that's where do you think the, the challenges are financially um, in terms of local local labor markets etc and then engaging in that conversation so um, one of the examples that we also have is 
is from Jordan, where through what's called a, a compact between basically the World Bank, the government of Jordan, and the, um, the European Union, the European Union promised to open up their um, uh, import, their, their markets to Jordan, Jordanian goods on the understanding that these came from special economic zones that would allow uh, Syrians to work in them, right? So you have sort of the whole, a whole circle of, of people admitting to do something in order to make it work, right? So um, that was a, a huge challenge for many years of, of actually allowing refugees to, to work in, in Jordan. So with that, we had um, work permits being delivered, et cetera. There's some talk of something similar in, in Ethiopia using the same model that not direct compensation, but saying, we'll do something, we'll help out on this side, then you'll do this, and then together we can actually move on some of these, these policies. Um, the, as with any of the other things I said, of course, implementation is, is always the critical side. You can have very nice um, intentions, but how it actually looks at, at reality is, is, is where, where we will see the difference, right? Because you get into conversation, is it actually jobs that Syrians are capable of taking, I mean, using that one as an example. Um, can women actually access, if they don't have daycare opportunities, if they can't write public transportation, how does that impact um, the ability of, of, of female refugees to take advantage of, of, of these opportunities, et cetera? So, um, so at the end of the day, and that's also what we're hoping with this level of, or this type of financing, right, is, is having a full circle between, between policy and projects, not just having having the project, but see how they can feed into the, some of those policy dialogues. Um, so, and we'll fail. I mean, on a, on a number of countries, on a number of situations, we will fail. I mean, this is, I think this is sort of well understood from, at least from our side, that it's a new endeavor and we still don't know how and, and, and what works, but, but really trying to engage in each specific country context to look at the opportunities, look at the entry points, and then trying to make the best out of them. And I think what we've seen in sort of our regular sectors, right, is that when we engage in a sector over a long period of time, supporting the governments is also, it becomes easier and easier to actually provide input into some of those policy conversations, rather than coming from the outside and saying, you should, you must, having that sort of constructive dialogue over, over a number of years. Um, so, Getting the views of refugees is in incredibly important, no doubt about it. So what, in general, what, um, depending on what type of project that we're doing, but especially sort of community-based projects that really try to get benefits to communities, getting the input of beneficiaries is integrated in the way that projects are prepared, um, negotiated, etc. cetera. Um, so, so that will be the, the challenge as we move forward, right? So we're used to work, the World Bank is very used to working with also local governments, uh, working with local communities. So what is this, and that's going back to that specific vulnerabilities of the refugees, to what extent are they allowed to have a seat at the table when you, for example, do community partic participatory planning processes, et cetera? Do they actually get in there, right? And that's gonna be a big role for our colleagues to keep track of that making sure that that actually happens. Um, but also then, uh, sort of in, in, in the implementation process, what we have is uh, sort of grievance redress mechanisms, right? So if beneficiaries are saying, we're not seeing we're supposed to you know, receive all this stuff and we're not getting anything, we think it's staying in the, in the government pockets, or that road you're building is actually destroying you know, important parts of our livelihoods, whatever you have where people are negatively impacted by, by a project, that's also then the next challenge. Can non-citizens actually use those same redress mechanisms? Um, so that's something, as it continues to be my sort of sorry standard reply, but that's also where we really see when we start uh, implementing. And that's where I think our role as sort of the, the displacement group is to try to support the sector-specific um, experts who know a lot about providing health services, but they may not know how to, how to work with displaced populations. So trying to work with them to figure out mechanisms that make sense, that's doable, that's workable, and that manage to capture the specific, as we talked about, the specific needs, the specific vulnerabilities of the refugees um, that, are, that are to, be, to benefit from, from these services or projects. Um, 
permission to ask a question. Cortland Robinson, uh, Center for Humanitarian Health faculty. Uh, you mentioned this question of a search for language and a common language and common indicators and possible new partners joining. Um, the question I would ask related to language is some would say forced displacement is at one end of a spectrum. The Your World Bank article points to that economic migration is at the other end, but there's a lot of muddiness in the middle, an indigenous person displaced by drought or environmental degradation coming to the city, often without work permits, without resources, a Myanmar migrant worker crossing into Thailand again, um, limited access to documentation, healthcare, and the rest. Um, you know, an economist and a lawyer might say, well, categories matter and certain classifications matter, but service providers and people who want to help would say they're vulnerable people. Um, they are moving uh, in context of significant risk, possible exploitation, their f capacity to return home, whether it's a rural area or back across a border, may be quite constrained by circumstance, and they've been there for decades anyway. What is home any longer? How, without sort of muddying everything and getting so inclusive that it becomes sort of a, a nothing at all for much of anybody, uh, how is this partnership grappling with that question. Let me just see. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm not sure if this, uh, hi, I'm Shreya, and I'm also an MPH student. Uh, I'm not sure if this is entirely relevant, but I was just sort of thinking about uh, what this, w what kind of an impact this would have on the underlying sort of conflict resolution situation in terms of the host country giving up, not giving up responsibility, but like sort of abandoning that responsibility of resolving. I mean, I know that's not entirely the World Bank mandate, but I'm just trying to think if this has been thought about in an integrated sort of. Any other uh, questions? I'm gonna just ask one or two, if that's okay, and then, because this will be the last one. One is actually, it's really a practitioner. How do you go into Burkina Faso and say to a government, you should provide jobs to refugees, refugees should be allowed to work when there's no work for their host communities and or in Jordan where we know there's such a high unemployment rate. So how do you practically do that and try to convince a government? And then the next one is a bit of a charged question, but um, your Economist World Bank, UNHCR protection, there is concern at times that the, the European Union gave money to Turkey and Jordan in order to make sure that refugees stay there and not have to move. So there is there is a protection concern there. Do you as the bank get involved in that? Are you concerned about that or, are you, or this happens and then you will try to make sure that that money is used in the best way possible? Thank you. So on the whole issue of migration and the sort of the, a nice need. I'm a I'm an economic migrant, right? And I'm I don't need any any support. And then you got you know poor, poor Malians sitting in in northern Burkina Faso. So you got those nice sort of black and white situations. Um, there is increased recognition that we have that 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 group in the middle that we can call, for example, desperate migrants, right? Which is um, can be poverty related, which can be environmentally related, which can be a, a, a host of different things. Even where do you put sort of the ones that are the violence induced in, in, in Central America, right? You have a lot of these populations which are of, of huge concern to us as a, as a development organization. I think you mentioned the key word vulnerability. Right? At the end of the day, that's where I think we, we should look. I mean, we still have the chance that it's been sort of, it's been divvied up a little bit in a siloed approach within the World Bank. We had us looking at forced displacement. We know we're only looking at IDPs and refugees. Conflict affected, and that's it, right? Then you have um, colleagues in the climate uh, change unit that's starting to look at some of the long-term trends in order to look at how that, how that impacts migration. Um, and then we've had sort of economists looking very much at economic migration in terms of the possible mainly looking at the positive aspects for development, including remittances, um, diasporas, and, and how, that, how that worked. All of them missing, then how do we deal with that, that group in the middle? Um, so it's something that's starting to come together now, um, partly because we're pushed to, and that's, you know, so it has some, <laughs> some good aspects of that, right? But at the end of the day, um, we won't, we're not strong on advocating for rights. That's not where we have much to offer. 
but we can look at looking at our experience, looking at our data on how do you integrate um, communities? How, how do you create inclusive communities that can actually take in people in, in a way that's manageable, right? But I think also we have a strong, uh, that goes back to some of the other questions as well, right? In, in terms of how we use our data and our evidence in a, as technocratic and non-political way as possible to be able to provide a little bit of platform hopefully a little bit of neutral ground uh, from which to have these conversations. So it's also a, a, a very fast evolving topic in the, in the World Bank, um, doing more to make sure that our household surveys, all our data collection actually captures not just citizens, but actually manage to get information on those that are not covered by, by sort of our, our regular um, tools. Conflict resolution is a very, very exciting and, and interesting point of view, right? Because it depends on whether you're talking about refugees and IDPs, right? In certain, in certain places, if you look at IDPs, right? Because I think that's often, that's where you actually have people in the conflict countries, right? Where you have that, that interplay between people movement um, and, and various conflict dynamics. Um, but we're dealing here also with very different things, right? You have a situation like the Colombian, where actually a huge number of the recorded IDPs are residing, where it's, it seems to be more of a matter of people having the right to compensation, right? You need, the status becomes important, so they actually have, have something to go home and claim. The question is whether they're ever gonna go home is a very different, a very different question. And as you say, if they do, how does that impact then local, local dynamics? So we, in the bank and in the international community in general, we have a lot of people who are looking at conflict dynamics, making analysis on a continuous basis on, on how these impacts, uh, how these um, processes work. Um, and also some of them looking at, at, at people movement and how, how demographies change. If you look at a place like Iraq, that's huge, right? I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I don't see any time in the future that Iraq should go back to the demographic makeup it had before the war. Um, Sunnis going back to, to their communities, et cetera. So what does that mean for us? First of all, what does it mean for the conflict or the uh, sort of peace building, if you like, dynamic in a country that you have, that we don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know who's gonna stay, who's gonna go back home. Are they gonna go a third place, right? But also the way then that we provide our support. Do we do that basis on the basis of assuming that people are gonna go back to where they came from? What kind of problems does that create? Or can we try to look at ways that, that integrates the conflict resolution with, with a new demographic map? It's hugely challenging. I don't have a very nice response for you because it's, it's very, very complicated. When it comes to host governments for refugees, it's very, also very context specific, right? Or to what extent do you have a country that's actually somewhat implicated in a conflict? Um, are they playing a part in the way? I mean, an example could be Rwanda and the DRC, right? Um, and that's also, I think, to be completely honest, not necessarily where we're strong, but that's where it's very important that we work closely with political actors, with um, security actors, uh, with others to, to have some of those conversations because that's a very tricky issue for us to, to, to get involved with. But that doesn't mean that it's not important and it doesn't have a huge impact on that. Other countries, let's say Burkina Faso, where as well, I mean, they have very little impact as such on, on the Malian conflict. On the other hand, they are seeing the spillovers, right? So you have some of the same dynamics and happening in that Sahel region, which is tied into what's happening in Niger, in Mali, et cetera, where, you, where it's very difficult to have a very national look at what's happening. Um, so, there's, so there's quite a lot of uh, studies, evidence trying to be built on this, but it's hugely complex. <laughs> And um, we're hoping to, to do our best. So on how to convince governments, um, I think what we found in general, and I'm not just talking about forced displacement, I'm talking about um, a lot of issues where the bank has not traditionally been involved, or they're seen as political. Our strength has been when we've been technocrats, gathering the evidence, doing the number crunching. Take an issue like gender. I mean, that was seen as cultural, that was seen as sort of advocacy, you know, that of course women should be equal to men. Okay, that's 
you can you can believe that, but in a way, there's, there's a belief, right? Other may not believe the same thing. But when the World Bank went in and actually did very thorough studies to show how much it costs in GDP annually to exclude women from the labor market, that has a very different, it makes it a lot easier for us to engage in that conversation. Not saying you should include women in the labor market, but actually you're missing out if you don't include women in the labor market. And the same thing with, with when it comes to refugees. At the end of the day, that's where we have, we're not an obvious advocacy or rights-based institution, right? What we can do and what we're trying to do is really trying to expand that analytical work that helps show what are the local, national, what, what are the impacts of, of leaving people out of the labor market or including them, right? So we did one study, for example, in Turkey, which is an example where we look at the impact of the, of the labor market of, of Syrians working. And you get to a very, very nuanced picture of, of, of most Turks actually being moved on to better jobs, but that you, of course, also had some losers among the poorest Turks that actually did, that did lose, that did lose um, job opportunities on that, right? So, and, and based on that, we can have a conversation of, look what it actually does on the positive side, and how can we work to help protect those that are losing? How can we try to, how can we minimize that? So I think that's the way traditionally we have been able to, to open up some of those, those conversations. Often it gets less he headlights, right? Because this is a little bit more technocratic, a little bit more sort of nitty gritty, etc. But that being said, we have a huge challenge in the fact that this is also is super political, right? As we've seen in the US, as we've seen in Europe, the same things is, is of course happening in other host countries. If you look at Kenya, for example, how it ties in with the di discussion about terrorism and the, and the role of Somalis in, in Kenyan society, this is not, just because it's a developing country doesn't mean that it's, it's not political and there's not certain political imperatives that makes it difficult, even if we have very good evidence that there are economic benefits to be made from including in the labor market or freedom of movement. Um, so that, that's still something that, that, that we have to respect, right? And that's, a, that's a, the limit of us working through governments as we can only go as far as they're willing to go and that then our shareholders are, are willing to then support them in, in that. Um, uh, so you had to, sort of on the... It was the political, it was the idea of the, e, of the EU oh, paying. Yeah. In, in essence, not necessarily following the spirit of the, the <coughs> convention, paying countries not to send them refugees. Yeah. It, it, but it's tied a little bit to the same thing. We don't necessarily, we, we have a difficult role to play there. <laughs> And, and, and going back to just saying, what, what are the evidence? For example, the, the Turkish example, right? What's, what's the evidence that we have? How can we support them then to implement projects that um, get, have better education outcomes for hosts and refugees? But, uh, but we don't have a huge, we have like the UN, we have the same government sitting on our, our board and the, and the ones ending up deciding how we act. So, so our, our role in, the, in that sense is limited beyond, beyond, the, beyond the data and evidence. But, but we still hope that that's actually something that can help. It's not going to move the needle hugely, but we're still hoping to be able to provide some of that data and evidence into the national debates. We're just completing a household survey of arrivals in Turkey and, sorry, in, in Greece and Italy, just to be able to say something more about who are refugees, who are migrants, how are they different, how are they the same, what are some of the challenges that the EU is likely to face in integrating these people. What's the literacy rate? Actually being able to say something about these people rather than being this big gray mass or just arriving on the shores and then let's try to keep them out, right? Trying to, to add a little bit of nuance, a little bit of evidence into those conversations and hopefully at least for those willing um, that they can, they can pick up from, from, from some of that evidence in, in, and feed it into the political debate. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, it really was a pleasure, and um, I'm sure some of the students may want to speak with you after, but thank you for coming with your, with your busy schedule. Thank you. I, I don't know if you have, I mean, you're welcome to share my email address to if there's any of you who wants to oh, follow up individually. That's a very deadly uh, request, <laughs> but we, we will do that with pleasure. Okay, and thanks for everyone here in the room and that was following from afar. Thank you very much. Thank you.